everyone. I'm Elizabeth. Uh, I just wanted to welcome you all and thank you for participating in the program today. We appreciate Diane uh, doing the program on the spot at Lanternfly. We are, as Tracy said, we're recording it and it will be online so that other people can access it if you know anyone who would be interested. And I have uh, one person who apparently hasn't showed up, but I'll make a point that she gets it. So, and Diane, I did forward your, uh, your emails about different sites and that to people earlier. Oh, today. great. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yes, that's great. Appreciate it. My turn? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Diane Diffenderfer, and um, I am currently the Master Gardener Coordinator in Wayne County. I've been doing that. I'm going into my fourth year. And before that, I had the same job in Montgomery County, and I did my Master Gardener training actually in Montgomery County in 2015. I'm a Penn State alum, uh, 81 and 82, I think, something like that. I did bachelor's and master's in horticulture. Then I went to business school. And uh, then I retired. So here I am, my part-time retirement job. Um, so thanks very much for having me. And it's uh, uh, you know it's always fun to talk with folks. Um, this topic is not you know so joyful, but um, it is a really important topic. So I'm glad that those of you who tuned in uh, took the time to do so. And as Elizabeth and maybe Tracy said, it will be recorded so others can watch it. So let's go ahead and get started. We do, Master Gardeners fall under the uh, Penn State College of Ag uh, banner at, or umbrella, if you will. And we're the land grant university in Pennsylvania. And that means that extension is uh, one of their primary jobs. And our job as Master Gardeners is really to provide science-based uh, information to the general public. So here's what we'll talk about today. Uh, how did this, by the lanternfly get here. It is not um, a native to the US. And we'll talk a little bit about the host plants and also look at different control methods. And again, if you have questions at any time, please just interrupt. Um, sometimes we get nice discussions going and that's always fun. So it, it was found in Pennsylvania, actually in Berks County is the epicenter in 2014. We think that it probably arrived in, um, in Pennsylvania in, at the Philadelphia port about two years ago, two years prior to that. So 2012, it probably made landfall on some contractor stone that was then transported from Philly up to Berks County. And the, the 2012 date was really calculated just as a result of the population that was initially found of the spotted lantern fly. So we've been working on uh, researching this insect now for about seven years and have made great strides, but still there is a lot of work to do, which we'll talk about. Um, you know, one of the, the tough things is that when, the, when it's not a native insect, there are no predators, no native predators for it. Um, so we have to sort of start from zero from a research perspective to try to figure out uh, how best to control it. it. It has been found in Korea. This is 2004. That's not recent. Um, and in fact, it now is in, I think, 20 states and in 36 counties in Pennsylvania. We just got at this Northeastern Pennsylvania just got added. I'm wrong, it's, it, I think it's in 11 states. So my mistake. Um, this map is from 2020. I don't have the updated one yet, but um, you can see that it is in Connecticut, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, uh, Virginia, and Delaware. So um, pretty widespread. And again, um, you know, primarily on the eastern side, uh, southeastern Pennsylvania is where the, uh, it made landfall in Berks County. Berks County, if you're not familiar, that's uh, Redding is in Berks County. So um, we are now under quarantine. So what that means, and the Pennsylvania Department of Ag is the governing body when it comes to issuing quarantines. And 
what it means is that no one may intentionally move a viable life stage of a spotted lanternfly. And we'll talk about the life cycle, but a, a viable life stage includes the eggs, the nymphs, and then the adults. So the big thing that we really worry about when we talk about the quarantine and stopping the movement of it is the egg cases, the egg masses, because they are, so if you look at this list of things that we're supposed to look at and check when we move from one place to another is, you know, from in, in the quarantine and out of the quarantine areas, anything outdoors, look at crafter materials. So, you know, bricks, stones, um, wood, any, anywhere on the vehicle, they, they don't mind if it's rubber, they don't, rust is fine. They really are pretty, um, they don't care at all where they lay the egg masses. So how can we tell if we've seen a spotted lantern fly? From time to time, we have gotten calls in extension uh, saying, you know, someone saying, oh my God, I think I, you know, I've seen a spotted lantern fly. There are a couple um, small butterflies and moths that look familiar. Um, the, the bright red color sort of catches people's eyes. And because there aren't too many insects with that particular coloration, uh, the first conclusion, if they're aware of the spotted lantern flies, that that's what they think it is. Um, so well, let's just look at the different stages. On item A is the egg case, and this is an older egg case. And the way that, or egg mass, I'm sorry, the way that you know that is because the, this covering over, the, over it, that putty color, is a little bit darker. And if you look closely, you can see that it's cracked and it's cracked because it hasn't had a chance to dry. Um, and we'll see a picture a little bit later of what it looks like when it's fresh. There can be anywhere from 35 to 40 eggs per egg mass. Item B is the, um, the nymph. And it, there are four nymph stages and the first three are this black and white color. So black with the white spots. And you'll see there that the actual size of this first instar, in each, each um, phase of the nymph is called an instar. So you have the first, second, third instars, which are all black with white spots. And then the fourth instar is now a half an inch long. And that's where we start to see that brilliant um, scarlet color. And the adult, about an inch long, is in the uh, bottom left image and it holds its, mostly you see it with its wings folded up as they are in, in D. It's rare that you see them with their wings extended because in fact, they don't, they're not flies, they're leaf hoppers. Um, they're very quick. And so they don't really flap their wings and fly per se. They can coast on a breeze, but um, it's not like a regular fly. So it's a little bit of a, a misnomer that we call it a fly, but but that's what we call it. So we're stuck with it. Um, so this is the difference between the fresh egg mass uh, covering and the one we just saw that was a darker putty. And here you can actually see the eggs at the top of this egg mass. Uh, some of those did not get covered. And you also see the adult. From this perspective, we don't know if this is a male or a female. We would think that it's probably a female because of the egg cases, the egg case right there. But um, we'll look at it in a minute to see how we distinguish between the two. They are the egg masses are laid in the fall. They usually start in November, um, may, maybe October, depending upon where you are. Uh, one of the things that's good for um, northeastern part of the state is that and actually all the state, I will say, is that the adults are killed in the winter because it gets too cold for them. Um, and because of that, we, we only get one life cycle. You know, several, many insects have multiple uh, life cycles per year, but the spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania has just one because of those cold winters. They're all, the eggs are often laid under protected areas at, um, in Montgomery County. Uh, I was down there a couple of days ago and I found them under the branches. You know, a branch comes off the main trunk of a tree, happens to be a maple tree, a sugar maple, which they like. And I could see 
um, egg cases underneath the branch. So they do try to put the eggs in a, in a protected place. So, you know, on the underside of the branches, on the, the leeward side of the um, uh, posts. And if you look at the picture on the right, you can just see that mass. There are so many egg masses on there. And, and think about, you know, 35 to 40 eggs per mass, that is a lot of potential spotted lanternfly adults. Um, here's some examples of where they've been found. Uh, just out in nature, light bulbs, um, old tires, they don't mind laying on fabric, and wood um, is also a prime target. So uh, the male is on the left, the female is on the right, and the difference is, you see they both have yellow bellies, um, but the female has a bit of red at the very tip of her abdomen. This is a pretty cool image. This is the fourth star uh, nymph. So it's uh, you can't really see the red on it too much, but this is the adult um, coming out of that fourth star. So that's, you know, they molt and then the, the adult here will take a little while and rest and get its coloration and then be ready to go. So um, insects are primarily, well, one of the way that they're categorized is by the type of mouth part that they have. And um, like a, a, a Japanese beetle, for instance, is a chewer. You know, you can, they just munch. Um, a fly has a, it's called a soft spongy mouth. And so this is another reason that this is not a fly. Um, it actually is, like I said, a leaf um, hopper, and it has a piercing sucking mouth part. And this is the piercing sucking mouth part. It's like a proboscis, it's like a needle. Um, it's uh, hollow because it will pierce, uh, it doesn't, can't really pierce the bark very well, but it pierces the new growth on, um, on its host plants. And as it, so what it's sucking up is sort of that sugary, sweet um, sap, or it's in horticulturally it's called, or botanically it's the phloem. And the phloem moves from the leaves down to the roots. So it's the leaves photosynthesize, they make sugar and energy for the plant, and it goes down to the roots. Um, so that's sort of what they're going after. They, can, they are unable to utilize all of the um, sap that they feed on, and therefore they excrete this sugar water that we also call honeydew as it feeds. Um, and we've also learned through research that the piercing sucking mouth part, it's not, sucking is a little bit of a, um, it's not really right because in fact with these guys, they're not sucking it out. Rather, they pierce the stem and you know how there's pressure, the turgor pressure within that plant um, is one of the things that keeps it upright, you know, it keeps it straight. So when you pierce that, the phloem or that sugary sap go raises up. It's just like a straw, but there's no sucking involved. You, you know, this thing you can do with your finger. Um, so it, we think that in fact, it relies on the turgor pressure of a plant to feed as opposed to actually actively um, sucking the, the phloem into its mouth. So here are a bunch of spotted lantern flies zipping around on some grapes. And we'll see them on other fruit. And one of the interesting things is that they do not by and large bother the fruit at all. They are going after the stems to the leaves and um, where they can, the new tender vines. This is sooty mold, black sooty mold on a grape leaf. So remember that they're, as they're feeding, they're excreting the honeydew and the honeydew um, is sticky and it falls on the leaves beneath, in this case, uh, these grape leaves. And that sugary substance is great for mold to grow on. And in this case, what grows is the stuff called black sooty mold. And it attracts um, other insects, particularly 
um, some stinging insects, uh, black or yellow jackets like it, uh, and ants as well. Uh, they're stingers usually. But um, the issue with honeydew or with the black sooty mold is that you can see about a third of this leaf is covered in, in the mold. And where it is completely covered, the leaf is not, those cells in the, in the leaf under that sooty mold are no longer able to um, photosynthesize. So the plant is unable to make an, as much uh, sugar and energy as it normally would. So when we talk about a decreased vigor in plants that are being feeded on, feeded, being fed um, on by the spotted lanternfly, what we're talking about is this type of decreased vigor. It makes, and when a plant is less vigorous, it becomes more susceptible to disease and um, other insect damage. Anybody have any questions yet? You all okay? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the host range. What kind of plants does it like to feed on? So its preferred um, hosts include the tree of heaven, grapes, which we talked about, black walnut, uh, different types of maples, birches, willow, sumac, and about 70 to 80 other um, trees. A couple of years ago, there was a pretty uh, significant concern in the Christmas tree industry uh, in, in Pennsylvania because they weren't sure whether or not the spotted lantern fly would feed on the conifers. And the good news is that, as you can see, substantial feeding was not recorded on conifers, so it doesn't seem to, uh, to gravitate toward the evergreens, which is certainly good news for the Christmas tree industry. But you can see how this tree is just completely covered with adults. Um, so, I, you know, I mentioned that part about stressing and a reduction in vigor. So they're calling it a plant stressor. And, and when the tree is stressed, it, it becomes less vigorous and then um, has an increased susceptibility to diseases or actually, I didn't mention this, unfavor weather conditions as well. And this is where you do see some death in um, plants by the spotted lantern fly. But uh, you know, as it says here, it, it has been observed, has not been observed to kill plants except for the tree of heaven, small saplings and grapevines. And that's really through this feeding as opposed to anything else. So this is how it might look in your backyard. Um, if you live in Southeast, Eastern Pennsylvania right now, they're just about hatching. Um, and these are the adults just completely covered. And the takeaway from this image is that um, as the adults were, are feeding on the upper part of the tree, uh, and there's this, you know, there's a car and a swing and a wheelbarrow, all of those things, if they're underneath, you know, as the first two items are underneath this tree, as they feed, they will um, excrete honeydew and their outside um, materials will be covered with honeydew. So they'll also be sticky. And if they're not clean, you'll also get that black sooty mold. Here we see it in apples. And again, just like we saw with grapes, the spotted lanternfly do not touch the fruit. They're going after, they're feeding on the stems um, of the plant as opposed to the fruit itself. Same thing again on the grapevine. Now we'll talk a little bit about them in um, ornamentals. This looks like some type of uh, maple. They like maples very much. Um, so how do we identify the tree of heaven? Um, there are a couple outstanding and, and uh, plant parts that are, that you're able to differentiate it from other plants. And um, first of all, the leaves are what we call pinnately compound. So this entire, um, leaf at the bottom with a yard sticky. So it's about three feet long. It has a mid rib called a rachis. And then off of that mid rib are leaflets. So in this case, I think they're like 30 little leaflets and the entire 
um, the entire thing is one leaf. So they're pretty significant. Um, if you look at the upper picture, you'll see that the margins or the edges of the leaf are smooth. Uh, the other, the alternative to smooth is called serrated, and that's when they have little cuts in them. Um, sort of looks like the edge of a serrated knife. Um, the other tell for uh, the tree of heaven leaf is you see the two little circles and they're circling on the left one little knob and then on the right two little knobs. Um, so some people call them knobs, uh, some people call them dog's teeth. And that's another indicator that it is the tree of heaven. If you squish it, um, the, the stem or the, the leaf, well, the, the rib, it smells like rancid peanut butter. There are male and female trees. Um, if you drive down the Casey Highway into Scranton, uh, this time of year, you'll start to see the male and female trees along the side of the road. Um, there are these clusters of uh, Samaras, and that's what the, those little things that you stick on your nose, that's what those are called. Um, and that's how the, that's where the seeds are. The bark has a cantaloupe-like skin. It's smooth and just sort of a little bit rippled. So it's, it's pretty, um, so the male is on the top and the female is on the bottom here. So, um, so the question is, is this a tree of heaven? So we'll look at a couple different things. We see the bark is rather rough and grooved. It's not the cantaloupe skin. It's producing nuts, which the um, tree of heaven does not. And if you look at the leaves, you'll see that the edges, the margins are not smooth. They're actually, they have very little um, serrations all the way across and they don't have the multiple knobs. Um, so this is in fact the black walnut. So here's another one. Um, you see its stem, the stem on this one is uh, a little fuzzy and the cluster, the flower cluster looks like a spike. And the leaves are really the tell, I think, and, and I guess the flowers, but um, they're, the margin is very serrated. So this is the staghorn sumac. And as the flower spike matures, it will turn that uh, telltale red that we're so used to. So here we have a cantaloupe skin, we have a smooth stem, and we have the knobs or dog teeth at the bottom of the leaf, our leaflet, I'm sorry. And um, this little scar, some people think it looks like a heart. And when you see, look at it at the base of the, um, at the rachis of the base, base of the rib where it attaches to the stem, it does look a bit heart shaped. So this in fact is, um, is the tree of heaven, okay? In terms of dispersal, it really is pretty much on the Eastern coast again. It's also not a native, it was brought over um, from Asia. I don't remember the date, but it was brought over as an ornamental. Um, but now they tend to grow in soil that's not very well conditioned. You also see them you frequently see them moving into areas where there has recently been construction. Some people call them trash trees. Um, so how about other crops? Let's take a look. So today, no damage uh, on any agricultural commodity except for the grape. Again, what it does when it feeds on those grapes is that it reduces the yield because it reduces the vigor of the overall plant. Um, and it is very difficult for the growers to control on, on, uh, on grapes. You know, Pennsylvania is a, uh, provides, grows a lot of grapes, makes a lot of wine. So that is definitely an agricultural concern. It has been seen on some, and these are hops, um, so it has been seen on hops, but it doesn't seem to create as much trouble on hops as it does on some of the other um, plants, the hosts that we've mentioned. You may see it in your backyard, um, uh, and here you see it on basil, blueberries, as well as cucumbers. 
Um, I haven't seen any up here yet uh, in Montgomery County that people do have them in their gardens. And even the uh, the flowers on the, you can see the, the instar first, second or third because they're black with white spots um, on this hibiscus. So there are things that we can do. Um, just, you know, sort of us as, you know, people who take walks in the woods as gardeners, as just concerned citizens. Um, and what we can do are these five things. We can help stop the spread. We can scrape and smash the eggs. Uh, we can use traps on trees to, um, to trap the adults and the nymphs. Remove the tree of heaven. And um, you can apply insecticides. You see what we've done. It Number one is sort of the least toxic. Uh, this is a listing of really um, so in going from things that we can do day to day, um, again, not toxic, doesn't really require too much equipment. And as we go down the list, um, what the management techniques become more involved. So uh, this particular, this absolutely involves uh, or, or pertains to us being in the um, in the quarantine zone and with people coming and going from the maybe the southeastern part of Pennsylvania or other parts of Pennsylvania and New York. They sometimes they bring firewood, they bring outdoor equipment if they're coming to summer here. Um, all of those items need to be checked before they they come into Pennsylvania and the counties that are under quarantine, as well as they should check before they go out and leave so that they don't want to take a hitch head. The, the um, spotted lanternfly has these, its feet are very sticky and they can hang on to a, the inside of a wheel well and go all the way to New York. They will not have a problem with that. So we call them hitchhikers from time to time. Um, so you do, you, it's a good idea to check your car if you're going back and forth. And firewood um, is really like a no-no when it comes to transporting stuff back and forth. Scraping the egg masses is very satisfying. Um, and in this case, this guy, this person has a little stick and they're scraping the egg masses or the egg mass and the individual eggs into a little container that has either hand sanitizer or alcohol. Um, if they fall on the ground, if somehow, you know, if you find one and you're scraping it and some of the eggs fall onto the ground, they'll they can survive so bend down pick them up and plop them into the, your little container um you can also squish them like i said and in some cases people have burned them but you know the, the folks that are heavily quarantined and, and have high populations are out on a regular basis scraping these egg masses off of the trees not only in their own home but on the in the local parks and in the woodlands as well So uh, yeah, one thing about how the the sort of the how the nymphs work is that they may be the, they may have hatched halfway up the tree, but first they go down and then they go up. So one of the first things that we started to do in terms of uh, uh, setting up barriers to control them is to use these sticky bands, which basically is like fly paper that you wrap around the tree. And it was reasonably effective. Um, you'll see this in this case, you know, it's covered, has that, you know, little ring around the bottom, but it also catches things that are not spotted lanternfly. So it can catch good insects as well as those insects that we would rather not have around. And that is one of the problems with these, um, these sticky bands. One of the other issues is that you, they, you can get something called bycatch. And that's where not only are you catching insects, but you can even catch things that might be a little bit bigger, like small mammals, little birds. Um, and so for that reason, um, the, well, the first thing that they did in Bucks County or Berks County is started wrapping the sticky bands with chicken wire to to keep some of those larger mammals off of the um, off of the sticky tapes, and bats were a big issue. They were catching a lot of bats. Um, so, over the last year, I would say we've moved away from recommending sticky bands, and now what we have are these um, circle traps, 
And basically uh, you're making, and you can make these at home. They're also commercially available, but the gist of it is that you, you fashion this, you, you bungee this to a tree, the tree, and where you've seen the eggs and, or you expect them. And you're making a funnel with some fabric at the bottom. And so the funnel, uh, that fabric lays against the side of the tree. And as the nymphs or the adults climb up the tree, they go into that fabric funnel and up. And on the right-hand side, you will see the top of that funnel and some adult insects. So once they get up, um, there's this jar on top and they can't get back out. So they're stuck in the jar. They're similar in some ways. They're sort of like the upside down version, I guess, of the Japanese beetle traps that we all sometimes use. Um, this little red, um, it's like a little block, foam block. It's actually, a, uh, it's called a pheromone stick and it has a scent that will draw the spotted lantern, <coughs> excuse me, the spotted lantern flies into the trap. So that's the circle trap. You can make them at home. Um, you can, there are directions for it on the extension website. It takes about a half hour, 45 minutes to make. It's a fun little crafting project. So the next thing um, on that list of things that we can do is actually removing the tree of heaven. And um, it, it will, uh, help to reduce the spotted lanternfly population, but it will not get rid of the infestation completely because there are other hosts. If you are going to kill it, and there are good fact sheets um, through extension that explain the process for killing the spotted or for killing the uh, tree of heaven, and it's important that you follow it because a lot of times people's first response is to just cut it down and then. Um, some people will paint it, paint this the uh, stub, the stump. Other people will pour gasoline on it. There's a, sort of a variety of things that people do um, that they think will be helpful in terms of killing the tree. For the spotted or for the um, tree of heaven, none of those things hold true. Uh, the, what, the way that you kill it actually is that um, you use an herbicide and you spray the, an herbicide on the tree. Um, and wait 30 days and then cut it down. So this, um, the herbicide is a systemic, which means that it travels through the, the tree's system and goes down and kills the roots. Because if, if you don't get the, the um, if you don't kill the roots, the tree will think that it's been under attack, which it has been because you've lopped it off, you know, you've lopped the most of it off. Um, so it will start sending up shoots and it has an extensive root system and it will just continue, it'll just be worse. So it gets, they first they get treated with herbicide, wait 30 days, and then you can go ahead and, um, and, and cut it down. Okay. And if you're using, if you do this, it's best to follow the label uh, directions and precautions. And there are there actually was a tree of heaven in Honesdale that was treated two years ago, and uh, they did a pretty good job. I think actually a, a, a pest control person did the spraying because it was a rather large tree. So you may have to do it more than one season also because of the root system. So again, you know, when it comes to chemical treatment, you do not do the cut the, cut the step method. Um, you apply a foliar spray, and then we're gonna look at these other two called basil bark and hack and squirt. Um, the first time I heard hack and squirt, I wasn't even sure what the person was saying. It was like such a weird thing. I thought it was a snack, I wasn't really sure. Um, so, in the, so in the image here, um, you, can, you can apply a foliar spray in the spring, uh, but what the problem here is that you get the dead tops and if it's not systemic, it's going to sucker. So it, it, that's not really the best time to do it. The best time is more in, you know, this is actually going into June is a good time to do it. Um, this is a management calendar and this is, should be in the information that I sent to you. If not, um, the, again, go to the website, you know, Penn State's website and just 
type in spotted lanternfly and you get tons of information. Same is true for the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. They have a great website for spotted lanternfly. Um, so, you know, here they're saying, you know, do the foliar or stem uh, treatment, you know, from July, mid-June into October. You can mow it, but again, it's only temporary because it will start to sprout again. And here you can see a little bit of that root system and it, it really is a spreader. You do have to be careful. So this is what happens from the tree's perspective when it gets attacked and, and cut. Um, it sprouts from the cut stump and then also from the root system itself. Uh, glyphosate is the, and um, treclopor, it, those are the two um, herbicides that are frequently used. And in this case, they're not, these are ferns. These are not tree of heaven. Um, I think he just show, put that image in here just so you could see somebody using a backpack sprayer and applying um, a foliar spray to the vegetation. Basil bark is used on trees up to six inches in diameter. And again, this guy has a backpack sprayer with a little hand crank on it that keeps it pressurized and a, a spray wand. And you spray all the, around um, the trunk up to about 12 to 18 inches of that. Okay. Um, here's hack and squirt. So what you're doing is you make a number of frills and the frill is just a cut. A, a, so you can see it in the bottom left, just like a wedge cut in the tree. And you make one, one frill for each inch of the um, diameter of the trunk. And again, and then you apply the material um, right inside the, the cut that you've made, okay? You don't girdle the tree because if you girdle the tree, you are, so the tree's vascular system runs up and down, you know, outside of the tree, just under the bark, a couple layers in. If you girdle the tree perfectly, um, you have now, you've, you've cut the vascular system. So the, what you, the herbicide will no longer travel down to the roots. So it's important not to do that. That's why you just make these um, little hacks, the little frills in the bark. There is a, um, the, the trap tree we're gonna talk about in a minute, but it, and it, there are several slides for it, but it, you can, there's a free video that you can find on the website and we'll show you um, how trap tree systems work. So basically what you do is that you, if you have a grove of Alanthus or um, the tree of heaven, which you often do because of the way they spread, um, you're going to kill most of them with an herbicide, the way we talked about. Um, spray it, wait 30 days, kill it, uh, especially female trees because of the um, seeds. And so we'll have one or two with trees left. And those trees will then be treated with a systemic insecticide. So you're injecting the insecticide into the tree. And as the spotted, lan the, the spotted lantern fly only have two trees to chew on, um, and they've both been treated with this insecticide. And when they feed on those trees, they in turn will die. So that's the trap tree. And here you see a bunch of dead ones at the base of the tree. Um, I think that this was included in the um, links that you received and it goes through very clearly how to identify and then how to remove the tree of heaven. In terms of pesticides, um, there are a lot of options, um, home remedies, are not the way to go. They're unsafe for humans, often pets, plants, and, um, and in some cases illegal because you're using them in a way that they were not meant to be used. They don't come with instructions how to, on how to use them, how to store them. Um, so the best thing to do is not use home remedies, although we hear about them on a regular basis. 
Some people use detergent. Uh, WD-40 has been a popular um, spray on them. So what they would do with this is they cut it and then they spray it with WD-40. They may dump alcohol on the cut after they've cut the um, trunk. And also some people pour gasoline on it as well. So in general, please do not um, use home remedies. If you want to use a chemical treatment, then um, use something that is labeled for the tree of heaven. Uh, so the, the botanical name is um, uh, the Alanthus and um, Alt Alanthus altissima. And that's in all of the publications that you'll see as well. So it should be labeled for use for that particular plant. I believe you got this one too. If not, I have a lot of these at the office and can bring them to the library. So people can pick these up. And this is a relatively new um, a management tool that, that was put out by Penn State on uh, pesticide safely or safety, sorry. Uh, I think I'm, you know, when, in, when you're looking at insecticides too, just as a, a reminder, um, the systemic is the one that we talked about that goes through the vascular system of um, the tree and then also the insect. And there are also contact um, insecticides and you spray that, you know, as a foliar on the, on the tree. And then as soon as the insect comes in contact with it, even through its feet, um, it can, um, it, it becomes uh, infected or, you know, it will die. So um, just something to think about in terms of um, insecticides, fungicides and herbicides also are somewhat similar to this. Um, so these are, these questions at the bottom are, are good questions in general. You know, what kind of plants are you trying to protect? Um, what, you know, some people will, are pretty quick to spray whatever it is that they see that they're not sure of. They figure that, um, I understand this is a gross oversimplification, but we do get a lot of questions about what can I spray on this insect? And they don't know what insect it is. So we're understanding what it is that you see and how many, how big the population is, is important when you make management decisions, uh, particularly if you're going to use a toxic substance or a material. So it is important um, to sort of take an internal evaluation about what your level of tolerance is um, for, the, for anything really, for weeds, for insects in your garden, for the spotted lanternfly. So do you see any damage? Um, do you just have a few? Can you catch them? They're very hard to catch, by the way. We catch them with um, nets because they're quick. They're, they jump. The best way to, if you ever see one, the best thing to do is come at it head on because they can't see straight ahead. They sort of see off to the side, so they can't see you. So you can tramp on them um, quickly or hit them with a fly swatter if, you, if, you nose, if you're nose to nose to them. Um, this is a, just a listing of different contact insecticides that will control both nymphs and adults. This is also in one of the handouts. And this is particularly nice because it tells you whether or not it's toxic to birds, fish, or bees. Um, it also talks about the level of um, activity against how good it is against the spotted lanternfly itself and whether or not there's any residual activity or does it get washed away. So all of these are important considerations when you are thinking about, again, using a, a chemical to use, uh, uh, to control or manage the spotted lanternfly. I think I mentioned this earlier that one of the you know difficulties with the spotted lanternfly and actually any non-native is that there are no predators, um, natural predators for it. There are certain things that will eat the spotted lanternfly, and one of the biggest ones is the praying mantis. But praying mantis will eat anything; they'll eat good bugs and bad bugs, so they have no discretion when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, the spiders will eat them; they often get caught in their in their webs. The uh, 
the brown marmorated stink bug also will, will eat them. And here we actually see, I think these are fire ants. I'm not quite sure, um, but the, the ants have, have uh, wrestled down an adult spider or an adult um, spotted lanternfly. Again, these are just more um, fact sheets that you can get through Penn State. This is the extension website that you want to go to. And um, really, if you just type in Penn State Extension Spotted Lanternfly or just SLF, um, you will get to the right page. So this is just an image, sort of a closing image of some of the research that's being done by um, Penn State uh, folks. And here they're up or left, they're doing uh, grape research. Um, they're looking at on the top right, he's looking at different types of bands that can be applied to the trees. Uh, the bottom left, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what that person is doing. And I think the poor folks on the right, bottom right are counting the, um, the dead insects. So all part of research. Um, Hopefully they trade jobs so they don't have to always get stuck, you know, with the dead stuff. But anyway, one there's there are a number of places in Pennsylvania where they are doing research. One of them is located um, just outside Philadelphia in Norristown. In uh, it was an old park. Well, it is a park, but that's I think where these grape tree grape vines might be, or they might actually be in State College. But um, I'm not sure. But they do a lot of work in the southeastern part of. Pennsylvania because the populations there are so high. So that's, um, I think, all I have. Um, does anybody, any questions I can help with? I do. Go ahead, Anna. I just uh, was curious. Um, where can we pick up the fact sheets about um, about these? Are they going to be at the library, or do we need to come down to the extension office, or um, just what, or go online? What? Well, you can do any of those things. Um, except right now, the library doesn't have any. I will take. I have to go to the office tomorrow. We're not. The office is open, but nobody's there, like working. You know, we're still oh, okay. working remotely, but. Office, the office staff is there, but um, but we're not. So, um, but I have to go to the office tomorrow, and I will grab some of these and drop them off at the library. Um, you certainly can access them online and print them if you want to, or oh, yeah. come to the extension office and excuse me and get some. They have them there too. So as soon as Diane drops them off, we'll have them available here. And anybody who wants to stop by, we'll save you some, but we'll also just put them out so the general public can get them. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And you know, the extension office is in the old Sturbridge building, right? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some people still have gone down to where it used to be. And then they come wandering back up and it's like, oh, okay. So anyway. Just wanted to make sure I didn't want you to go out running around where you didn't have to. And Diane, if there are other things that you have that you want to just email um, Elizabeth and I, we will okay. forward, we, them. We'll forward right. them. It also, if anyone who, who has thinks of a question later on, you can email me and I'll make sure it gets passed on to Diane too. Yep. That, that's great. All right. Well, you know, I don't know when we'll see them, but I chances are good that we will see, we'll start to see them in Wayne County. Um, if not this year, then probably within the next year or so. So um, unless we get out there and try to get rid of them all as we see them. So you're creating a, <laughs> a, an Avengers force. <laughs> I hope so. That's what we need to do. That's for sure. A couple of years ago in um, Reading, the, the favorite Halloween costume was the spotted lantern fly. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yep. That's funny. <laughs> I guess you know, they have to do something creative. There's a woman in Lehigh County that makes earrings and jewelry out of dead lantern flies. Oh, God. Oh, that's awesome. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, something for everyone. 
All right. Thank so yeah, you. if you have any questions, please just you know shoot them to to um, Elizabeth, and she'll get them to me, and I'll be happy to uh, answer them for you. Diane, do you have anything else coming up that we should make people aware of? Um, are you doing any other uh, meetings? Yeah, we have, there are two webinars that are coming up. Um, we're still not doing anything face-to-face -face, and that's probably true for the next, probably the end of the summer. We're not really sure yet. Um, on June 24th, there is a, and these are online, you can see and register for them there. Um, there is a webinar, the woman who's speaking is a horticultural educator and has written a couple books and she's going to give us a presentation on pruning, which oh. is basically ornamentals. It should be very good. I think uh, her name is Eva Monheim and it's M-O-N-H-E-I-M. -E so if you, search that on you know our website you will be able to see that and you can register the price is five dollars um because we have to pay her a speaker's fee and she'll talk about she actually has i, I have i think some images from her recent book that she just published it's on um pruning hedges and shrubs i think so it's a nice book and uh and she's a great speaker. She teaches at Longwood Gardens. She's at a number of different um, arboretums in the greater Philadelphia area. She used to teach at Temple University. And then on July 21st, we have another um, webinar on garden insects, home garden insects. And the speaker for that is Steph Jones. I worked with Steph for a number of years at a CSA um, in Montgomery County, and she's the assistant farm manager at that, um, at that farm now. And so she put together a pretty terrific slideshow. She'll go through the anatomy, sort of classification of insects, and then how to control them, how to identify them and how to control them in a home garden setting. That one, I believe, will be free, and um, it's not on the website yet, but it should be very soon. Um, and both of those are at 7 in the evening and run until 8.30. Fantastic. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go ahead also and uh, plug for Honesdale High School and Kayla, who did oh, the, yes. they have a plant sale coming up this weekend and next weekend we do have the flyer up on our website um or the wla's website if i haven't already put it on ours but they are selling all of uh, a wide variety of plants that the kids grew during the school season in the hydroponics and greenhouse right. up oh. at school. And, and both vegetable and flower plants and hanging baskets too right and you say it's at the school Yes, it's at the greenhouse. They built a greenhouse at the high school. So that's where the sale is, at the greenhouse. Yeah, there's an open house this Saturday also yep. at the, the greenhouse. Yeah, well, that's the... And you can buy your plants at the same, same time, time, I believe. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I would just like to say that, you know, Kayla, the students did a huge um, job for, uh, for the Master Gardeners. There's a new program that we're starting uh, we're not starting, but it's a statewide initiative for the master gardeners across Pennsylvania. It's called Seed to Supper. And um, it is, it's an educational program that will roll out next year and will offer six classes for people who are interested in learning to grow some of their own food. And we're starting this year um, by, and this is where the Kayla students came in, as well as a Home Depot. Home Depot donated 40 of the big orange five gallon buckets to us um, for this project, as well as enough container soil to fill all of them. And we dropped that stuff off at the high school or at the greenhouse and the students drilled holes in the, you know, drainage holes in the pots, filled them. And then, and they had grown a lot of seedlings for us. 
And so they planted, I think each pot get a, gets a vegetable and a flower or maybe two vegetables. Um, and we donated a lot. We got a lot of donated seeds from burpees and also from another seed house out on, in California. And so we donated a lot of those seeds to the school and to the kids. And, uh, but they've really been so helpful, you know, for us. That's fantastic to hear. And it's nice to see those partnerships going on. Yeah. Um, the last thing I'll just throw out there for any of you who do home gardening or who know any farmers or people that sell at the farmer market, farmer's market, every one of the libraries, all seven of us have something called the community garden cart. So if you are somebody who grows a lot in your garden, but you grow too much and you don't want it to go to waste, we have the garden cart there that you can, you know, leave some of your extra so that it doesn't go to waste and people can just take it. So it's give, you know, give what you can, take what you need, um, helping kind of neighbors and community members get a taste of some fresh vegetables and cutting down on food waste. Mm -hmm. So if you have a little extra that you want to drop off, please spread the word and let people know that those community garden carts are there. Yeah, that's great. I, I, that, I think that's a terrific program. The, I, I failed to admit to mention that the um, Area Agency on Aging is is sort of our partner in the Seed to Supper program, and the people that will be enrolled in the class and who actually um, who are getting, I think we we put a notice out that we have these buckets. We have fifty buckets, you know, with um, vegetables. Uh, I think nineteen or twenty current folks who, who go to the land, the Honesdale food pantry for pickup have, I have said that they want a bucket. So we're, we are handing those out on June 8th to folks. Fantastic. Um, and you yeah, can drop off some literature for that too, Diane, if you'd like to leave that here at the library, we'll post. Okay. It. Thank you. Yeah, that would be terrific. Um, and then the extras will just, will be in contact with the other food pantries. And if anybody needs, you know, needs a bucket, just let us know. So if you hear of anybody, we're happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's our pleasure. So I want to thank everyone for attending. We appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the program and have some ideas on us how to squash lantern flies. <laughs> and we we also learned that girdles are bad in any given situation. <laughs> and Wait, we knew that, right? <laughs> <laughs> And that the spotted lantern fly may be kind of pretty looking, but it's really seriously gross. So those are those, if those are your only take homes. <laughs> but thank you, Diane. We really appreciate You're welcome. it. Yeah, my pleasure. It's nice to see you guys. Thanks for tuning in. And, thank you so much. Uh, oh, you're welcome. It was fun. If you know people who want, you know, Master Gardener's Way, we actually now have a speaker's bureau. So we are putting together sort of a list to, to get out to folks and garden clubs, groups, whomever, um, we're happy, you know, we'll talk to anybody. So, uh, and we have a list of now, I think maybe eight to 10 programs that we can offer. So, wow. Okay, thank we're getting you. there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Diane. Oh, you're welcome. It's really, it's really fun. You know, it's very fun. We love doing this. So thanks for attending and have a nice evening. Thank you. You, you too. You do the same. Bye-bye.